Hi everyone, I'm Noah and this is The Perceptions of Injustice. In this video, I have compiled a series of clips that provide insight into the positions and perspectives of the people involved in the Dan Markel case. Included are clips of Wendy Edelson's cross-examination and Jeffrey Lacasse cross-examination where they answer the same questions asked by prosecution and defense uh, lawyers. Also, I have included some clips from Judy, the YouTube lawyer, where she's talking, where, where she's reading the transcript of Donna's emails to Wendy and from Wendy's first interview with the police department to help us get a fuller picture. He was complaining about you refusing to communicate with him about right of first refusal to the children during your time with them. I know he was frustrated about the Skyping, mm -hmm. lack of communication via Skype. But it's hard to Skype children. with with two toddlers, yes. Did you so, guys talk on the phone? We talked on the phone uh, once in a while. We did some video chats. I talked to the kids were via video chat and things like that. It was interesting for me that when asked by the prosecution if Dan had a problem with her of communication with the boys because she she wouldn't put the boys on Skype to talk to their dad. And she said, yes, it's very hard to talk on Skype with toddlers. On the other hand, Jeffrey Lacasse was asked a random question about, uh, I think the question was like, so were you communicating back then? He, wa he wanted to answer the question to paint a picture of what their relationship was like in that time that they were talking about. So he said, while talking about their relationship yes our communication was good we, we were talking we were video chatting I was video chatting with the kids so it's interesting to see that life is all about priorities for Wendy it was hard to Skype with two toddlers so they can talk with their father but it was easier for her to talk to her boyfriend at the time and have her kids with her video chat with her talking to him and when i see it's all about priorities i'm not saying that i'm not defending dan in particular in this particular situation because i think in my opinion it is the boy's right to talk to their dad much more than it's dan's right to talk to their children to be respectful of the children's rights this is this should be the priority if the kids were a priority for real it shouldn't be this way it should be easy for them to talk to their dad on skype it should be encouraged by you if anything so your single brother is pretty handsome guy right i think he's handsome right We've and you indicated that there was a dinner where you met charlie Anderson. that's right that's kind of a good looking guy right Sure. Is Charlie good looking? She answered like, I think he's handsome. And then when Lacasse was asked, he was very serious. Sure, because he knows his role on this stand. He knows what he is coming to do over here on the stand. He is coming to help solve the crime. This is his job over here sitting on the stand to answer any question. It's interesting for me that she laughed about it. Actually, we can see in this clip the difference between a genuine response and a disgenuine response. And what kind of car does he have? Um, for a while, what does he have? What is he driving right now? Well, he likes me, cars. Me, like he, he has a lot of cars, right? And these aren't like Hondas or Toyotas. They're Mercedeses and Ferraris, right? He drove an unmarked police car for a while. But that wasn't my question. My question was, does he have a, did he ever have a Mercedes? I think so, yeah. Okay, and it wasn't like a C300. It was like a 5 Series, right? I honestly don't know anything about cars. Well, it was the bigger Mercedes, right? It, yeah, it was big. It was the bigger one. And he also had a Ferrari, right? I know he had one really fancy car, but I don't remember what, what brand it was. So you're telling this jury that you don't remember if your brother had a Ferrari? series right i honestly don't know anything about cars well it was the bigger mercedes right it, yeah it was big it was the bigger one and he also had a ferrari right 
I know he had one really fancy car, but I don't remember what what brand it was. So you're telling this jury that you don't remember if your brother had a Ferrari? Cars are really not important to me. You saw mine. <laughs> I drove a minivan. <laughs> well, but you're not your brother, right? I am not my brother. I no, I knew he had a fancy car. I just don't remember if it was a Porsche or if it was a Ferrari. It was something fancy. Something kind of fancy, yeah. right? Okay. What kind of vehicles does he have? Ferrari is the one that stood out to me. Do you remember the color of the Ferrari? I don't. Did you make any comments to Wendy about the Ferrari? Um, well, Wendy used to talk about Charlie having a Ferrari. I mean, oh. that was, um, she would say, my brother's a character, he has a Ferrari, he has an undercover cop car, <laughs> he has, a, I think, a nice Benz in addition or some luxury car. So she knew what a Ferrari was, right? Sure. Well, sure. So it's not like, she didn't say he's got a Porsche and you saw a Ferrari, right? No, it, it was it was a Ferrari. It was, and I actually remember discussing the cost of maintenance with, with Charlie. There were some downsides to having a Ferrari. Yeah. So. <laughs> It's tough. tough. Um, so what tells me that in this situation, the honest one is uh, Jeff is because while talking, he mentioned the unmarked police car. She mentioned also the unmarked police car. How would he know about the unmarked police car if she didn't mention it to him earlier? So she mentioned it, of course, many, many times, but she wants to deny if, if you remember that he has a Ferrari or not, how does it serve us people or you? How does it serve you? I had asked for a divorce several months earlier. Okay. That's when we started going to counseling. And he told me that if I, if I tried to get divorced from him, that I could leave with the clothes on my back and that he would take the kids and that I would be penniless. And so when I actually asked for a divorce, I thought it best not to be. However, hot temper and verbal abuse is what you need to emphasize that you suffered under his, quote, reign. You absolutely must emphasize that the only reason you left when he was out of town is because of the threat, quote, you'll leave without your children, without a penny, and just the clothes on your back, unquote. So the second clip over here from Judy, the YouTube lawyer, is actually Donna's email to Wendy. So after Wendy dropped the papers to Dan and left, surprisingly, the house with the boys, with the stuff, furniture, blah, blah, blah. Donna, she's trying to find a justification for Wendy as to why she left the way she left. And we see Wendy saying the exact same thing that Donna just told her in the email. This is how they justify this malicious act that they did. They both are on the same page on that. Fast forward now to September 10th, 2012. Professor Markell, he's away on a business trip, right? Yes. He's in New York City at New York University. But you do remember dropping the bomb on don't you, telling him that you wanted a divorce. Despite being at NYU for a presentation, he rushes home. He gets on the next flight, right? I honestly don't remember if he got on the next flight, but he did come home quickly. 2.30, he finds out in New York. By 11 p.m., he's walking in the door to your old house at Trescott Drive, right? I don't know. But you do know that when he walks in the house, what he finds, you know that, right? Yes, I left him the papers. You left the divorce papers on the bed? No. You were gone? I, I was gone, yes. And so were his boys? Um, his boys were not gone. He saw them the next day, and they would not have been awake if he's coming home at 11 p.m. He talks about not knowing where the children were, parentheses, incorrect, address, in parents, for the first six weeks. Let the court know that although he was never particularly interested in the children prior to the divorce, he was advised to keep a diary and make sure that he shows his interest now. You arranged to meet him the very next day with Alan and Lynn Grossman, mutual friends, and the children were at a local yogurt shop so that he could see the children were fine. You were in fear of his temper, and so you did not want to reveal your address. However, Four days after the separation, you arranged to bring the children to his house. Again, this is Donna's justification as to she, why didn't Wendy tell Dan about the location of the kids, of his kids. They were afraid of, their, of his temper. Was there any physical abuse? No. Do you think he's going to go after you physically? What were you scared about? Did Charlie Adelson 
like Dan Markell. And again, I'm referring to the time frame before his death. I mean, I think he was also, he would listen to me when I would tell him about things I was upset about at the time with the divorce. So whether he liked him or didn't like him, he certainly was supportive of me. Okay, but he never expressed any dislike? No. Did he mention hiring a hitman to kill your husband? Objection. He was like, no. Did Charlie ever say that he considered all possible options to take care of the problem, the problem being Dan Markell? Did he ever say that? No. Yes, ma'am. On July 13th, 2014, uh, Wendy and I were speaking, and she asked me if she could uh, share something with me confidentially. I told her, sure. She mentioned or she said that uh, Charlie had explored all options to take care of the problem and that he had looked into having uh, Professor Markell killed. It would cost about $15,000. I later uh, talked to Investigator Ice and said that could have been $50,000. They sound awful uh, alike. Okay, so you're not sure if she said 15 or 50. That's right, but I'm confident she made that statement. I just can't remember the exact dollar amount. It, and she did state that was during the relocation battle the previous summer is when that had taken place. All right. And the day that she made the statement to you was July 13th of 2014. Yes, ma'am. Did he ever joke about he looked into hiring a hitman, but buying you a TV as a divorce present would be cheaper? He did make that joke. I'm so worried about my kids. I don't know how I'm going to tell them what happened. And you know, they're, they're so little. <sighs> and, you know, it is difficult sometimes for the kids because they're such happy. Daddies. They love their dad. <laughs> They talk about superheroes a lot, and so sometimes they'll say, they'll joke, they'll fall over and be like, I'm dead. And I say, I really don't like it when you mm -hmm. say that. And, you know. So after the murder, while sitting in the police department being interviewed, she's talking to the victim advocate, saying to her, what am I going to say to the kids? There's so little, like she was heartbroken for her kids. And then she says that her kids sometimes they play with like fight or whatever and they come to the floor and they say I'm dead and she says to them don't say that I don't like it when you say that I wonder why she didn't say that to Charlie when he made that joke about hiring a hitman Wendy gives us a 0.1% of the truth and just fabricates a whole new story around it to mislead us. But when asked if, she, if he joked about it, yes, he joked about it and he tended to repeat himself and say the same joke. I think any normal person, if they were in her place and their brother would say something like that, I would just tell him right in the face, hey, stop joking about that. Stop it. This is the father of my children. Don't you dare say that even jokingly. But she did not say that. Otherwise, we would have known. We would have... She talked about this many times, that he joked that and repeated that. She didn't say even once, and I told him to stop joking about it. The fact that he repeated himself, so you did not stop him. Why didn't you stop him from making that stupid joke? Why? He came out there to serve, well, I guess to replace the TV. He came out to fix it and then told me that what was wrong with it wasn't fixable. Right. And so I called Charlie to find out, should I buy a new one or should I fix right. this one? And he was like, just buy a new one. And I know that I'm nitpicking here, but she says that when the repairman came to fix the TV, he told her it was unfixable. They cannot do anything about it. So she called Charlie. I wonder if she said that to justify why she had a call with Charlie at this time. I, I'm just speculating over here. Of course, this is just my opinion. He, so if he told you just fix it, what would you say to the repairman? Okay, let's fix it. And he would say, but I just told you it's unfixable. Do you remember your mom suggesting a plan to offer Danny a million dollars to allow the relocation of you and the children to South Florida? I'm sure I knew about it at the time that it happened. And then 
I had my memory refreshed about it recently. I don't think you realize the type of offer we're considering. We're planning on you, Charlie and dad and I going as high as equal parts in a $1 million offer. That's 333K from each of us. Is your family in South Florida wealthy? Are you asking me to speculate? No, I'm asking if they're wealthy. You may, if you don't know, you say you don't know. It depends how you define wealthy. Okay. Are they millionaires? No. We're going backwards in this yellow clip. Earlier, she asked her if her parents were wealthy. She said, are you asking me to speculate? She said, no, you can say, I don't know. And she then asked her, are they millionaires? And she said, no. So I'm going to go with what Wendy is saying and say it's true. Okay. Donna was, was, was planning on offering Dan $1 million, 333000 from each one of them to bribe him to relocate. So are you telling me that your mom wanted to spend like all the money that they have? I mean, if they're not millionaires, then I don't know. Is this a small amount of money? What do you think? Do you think this is a small amount of money? Do you think someone who's not a millionaire would confidently make such an offer? So are you putting all of your money for this? The reason why I say my parents are going to say I did it is because after we got divorced, I wanted to move to South Florida. And I filed a petition to relocate in the court. Um, and the court said no. So, cause the kids. Cause like, I mean, yeah. So you can always leave. You just can't leave with your kids. So, um, so we're, you know, we're in Tallahassee because of Danny's job. Was there a time during the time that you were living there at Aqua Ridge, Aqua Ridge that you determined that you would like to move to South Florida with the children? There was. Right. And were your parents very involved in trying to facilitate? Okay, but before that, before I continue with that, this is how their parents m must have thought or will think when they know about the murder, that she did it. And you see it from Ruth Markel's perspective, Danny's mom. She wrote in her book, she couldn't wait to get to Wendy and the boys to see, to, to make sure that Wendy is doing okay. Imagine that the mother wanted to make sure that Wendy was okay. And Wendy was thinking, they must now think that I did it. Look where Ruth Markel's mind was and look where Wendy's mind is. Was there a time during the time that you were living there at Aqua Ridge, Aqua Ridge that you determined that you would like to move to South Florida with the children? There was. Right. And were your parents very involved in trying to facilitate that relocation? My parents were supportive of me moving to South Florida. The most important part of your divorce is relocation. I sincerely hope your attorney understands that that is your non-negotiable. Lots of things are negotiable. That's the one thing that you cannot let her think. Being supportive is one thing and being the master of the plan and putting oil on the fire is a totally different thing because by saying they were being supportive, it means that this was the vibe. Okay, Wendy, is this what you want? Do you really think that re relocation is the best thing that you want to do? Yes, mom and dad, that's what I want to do. Okay, we support you in whatever decision that you make. We are here for you. But she begins her email to Wendy by... This is the one non-negotiable thing in your, in your divorce. You have to understand that. Is being over-involved in your personal business? As compared to other people's parents? Yeah. I don't know. Um, was Ms. Adelson very close to her parents and her brother, Charlie? Extremely close. You mentioned that you did develop a desire to move to South Florida. Did you file a motion to that effect on January 14th, 2013? That sounds, that sounds, I did file a motion. I don't remember the exact date. Okay. But that sounds about right. Was that motion granted or denied? That motion was denied. All right. Denied with prejudice? I don't remember. Okay. If you have it, you can, I'm happy to take a look. Okay. But in any event, you were not able to move at that time. I did not move. And were you 
upset about being stuck in Tallahassee. I was relieved. You were relieved. You wanted to stay in Tallahassee. And was Ms. Adelson happy about the fact that she was not able to relocate? No, she was quite bitter about it, actually. It was, a, as I said, a topic that came up. That, t- that tone came up on those first two days. So what do you mean you were relieved to stay in Tallahassee? Then why did you file the motion to relocate? One minute ago, you were saying that your parents were supportive. By by saying that, it means that this was your decision to relocate and they were supportive of it, right? How long did you stay in Tallahassee after your husband was killed? My I husband, sorry. stayed a couple of days. Um, and then... After I had asked the police for protection at the funeral or in my home and they refused, I decided to just go for a couple of days and spend a few days away from Tallahassee. And then this case hit CNN and hit the media. And I so didn't. I don't mean to stay. interrupt you, but the question was how long did you stay in Tallahassee after your husband was killed? I'm sorry, Ms. Kaplan. I stayed for a few days. So, of course, Wendy is trying to make this dramatic story of why she had to leave Tallahassee because she was scared for her life and her kid's life. And the police did not protect her. And so let's see what Ruth Merkel had to say about her leaving Tallahassee um, in her book. I'm just going to read a small passage. I'm not going to read anything big or huge. As we were leaving, I told Wendy that we would like to see the boys after those meetings at around noon, and she agreed nonchalantly. I said I would call when we were done to firm up the plans and wished everyone a good night. We hugged the boys goodbye, not knowing this was our last family visit in Tallahassee. So now Ruth Markel is saying what she's saying as we were leaving, this was the day of the funeral. They went back to Wendy's house to see the boys and stuff. So as they were leaving the house, the day of the funeral, okay, she told her, I want to see the kids since, you know, everything's going on. and She's in Tallahassee and stuff. And she said, okay. She agreed. Then she says, it was a difficult morning, but I got through it knowing that we would soon be spending time with the boys. I called Wendy to make sure that noon was still okay. So this was the next day, next day of the funeral. It's not, Wendy said. The boys are really busy. Okay, I said. How about 1 p.m.? Not today, Ruth, Wendy said. It's not a good day. I couldn't believe it. What a punch to the gut. I was feeling terrible already. This was my only connection to Dan. Tomorrow then, I asked, trying to keep my extreme disappointment out of my voice. Wendy said, yes, we would speak in the morning. When I called early the next morning, Wendy said Benjamin and Lincoln were still busy. But she put them on the phone with us. After we had gathered up everything, I decided to try Wendy again. We find so we found so many of Linky and Ben Ben's toys at Dan's house, I said, and we'd like to bring them over. Wendy didn't even pause. Unfortunately, you can't see them, she replied. I was so worried about their safety and mine. Then that we left the house and drove back to Miami right after we saw you. But Wendy, yesterday you said Benjamin and Lincoln were too busy to see us. I know, Wendy said. I wanted to tell you, but I couldn't. You know, for safety's sake, I'm sure you can understand. In fact, the police had been careful to tell us that even though they had provided security at the synagogue, they had no concerns about the safety of Wendy, the boys or us. Wendy is such a calculating person. She doesn't do anything just spontaneously. How could she pack everything and go with her and just move and never come back to Tallahassee? And also, why did you give her hope? Why did you give Ruth Markel hope that she could see the kids? Don't you think that the kids would feel that they left their father by himself in Tallahassee and just moved away. And not only they lost their father, but they lost even connecting to his parents, to their grandparents, who's the closest thing to their father. After the murder of Mr. Markell, did Charlie Adelson take you out for a celebration dinner? No. Do you recall any dinner 
where you, shortly after Mr. Markell's death, where you were with Mr. Charlie Adelson and vomited. I, I do remember that dinner. After Danny died, I was terrified that someone was going to come after me or my children and harm us as well. And so I didn't leave my house for about a month. And when I finally felt ready to leave the house and have dinner, I told my brother that I wanted, I wanted to have dinner, that I was ready to finally go to a restaurant and, and eat a meal again. And I'd barely eaten for a full month just out of grief and shock. And so that night when I finally ate for the first time, they, they ended up taking a while before they sat us and they sat us at the bar and I had a drink and I wasn't used to eating anything or drinking alcohol and I threw up at the table the only time in my life I've done something like that, but it was certainly not a celebration. And you never heard your brother refer to it in that way? No. Okay, so the over-explanation, the over-justifying of why she did throw up on the table makes me think, what is she hiding over here? Because it's, it's, I think it's normal. I mean, everyone gets sick, right? I mean, she doesn't have to explain it that much. If, if, if the prosecution is asking her, so this is when you threw up, she would have said a normal answer would be, yes, I had a flu bug. I had so much to drink i had i was hungry and i had but she explained it so much in my opinion who cares if she threw up or not because she said this is the first time that i've done something like that you've done what you threw up it's normal it's human it's human did mrs adelson tell you anything about the uh, celebration dinner anything about a celebration dinner Yes. Could you tell us about that, please? Yes. A, a couple weeks after uh, Professor Markell was uh, murdered, we spoke on the phone, and she had mentioned that uh, her and Charlie had gone to, this, these are her words, she said, Charlie and I went to what he described as a celebration dinner. And that was the dinner where she vomited? That's right. That's correct. Were you involved in any way in a plot to kill Dan Markell? No. <laughs> And I get why I would be a suspect, but the idea that we were divorced, but I would, the idea that I would ever do anything is like, I understand, I understand why they need to check, but I don't know, I don't know who would though, I don't know who would do this, I could see why they would think it would be me. I inserted this clip of her saying that because, okay, so now you understand why they are asking you all of these questions in the cross-examination, right? Are you aware, Mr. Lacoste, that Ms. Adelson suggested you as a possible suspect in this homicide? Yes, I am. And where were you when Dan Markell was murdered? I was on the road to Tennessee. I uh, originally had a trip planned for 11 a.m. on Friday the 18th, and I had, at the last moment, changed my trip to, to Thursday night. So. so you left early? I left early without uh, telling anyone. Um, other than the people at you know, the destination. Uh, Miss Adelson was the only person I had told in Tallahassee about the time that I was leaving, which was 11 a.m. on the 18th. I had informed her about that in, uh, around June 10th. All right, so originally it was going to be July 18th at 11 a.m. would be your departure? Yes, ma'am. And would you be flying or driving? I was driving. All right, and it changed to Thursday night, so you left the night before and were in Tennessee at the time of the homicide? That's correct. And you told Wendy that, hey, listen, I'm, uh, I'm going on this trip, and I'm leaving Friday morning around 11 a.m., correct? That's correct. And do you recall what time the actual shooting took place? I believe it was right around 11 a.m. The same exact time that you'd be leaving the area? Am correct. I correct? 11 a.m. after his workout, Markel drives back home and is headed up the driveway when his cell phone rings. Markel starts a conversation one he will never finish. He tells the man on the phone, oh, hold on, there's someone unfamiliar in my driveway. And as the man is on the phone, he hears some exchange, then he hears a muffle, a sound, a grunt. He never hears Dan Markell again. Somebody had walked up to Markell and shot him twice in the head. Do that if that's Jane, not right. who would have done this? I am just Dan, are they going to come after my kids? Or me. Who's next? Is Jeff this much of a lunatic? I didn't even think of Jeff. 
And I hope to God not. May I ask the Japanese? Yeah, of course. Yeah, I think you should. I think that that... It, Wendy's been seeing a guy called Jeff, who's a friend of James. Um, and but he's jealous. Yeah. Are you still currently seeing him, or just something you kind of <laughs> let taper off? It's been a bad week. Okay. Yeah, okay. Jane and I actually went for a walk together Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. <laughs> Early this week. Earlier this week. But you've taken a week, one week break. I took Jeff. a one week break from communication with Jeff to figure out what to do. Okay. Because we, we've been dating for like nine months, so like 10 months a year. Um, and when you use the word dating to you, is that that's my boyfriend or is it more of just dating, yes. like the casual? Yeah. No, like he was my boyfriend okay. and um, involved with the kids. And I mean, yeah. Um, and we had kind of a fight recently. Um, and he's been trying to get back together, and I didn't know if I wanted to. And so I, he actually, the morning that I gave that talk, my boys mm -hmm. were there, and Jeff was watching them, so I could give the talk. Like he's, um. While her interview is happening in the police department, Jane, her friend, came over to support her emotionally. Suddenly, she looks at Jane while talking to her. She looks at her and says, Jane, who could have done this? And she paused. She's waiting for an answer. She wants Jane to answer because she knows what Jane is going to answer. And this is just a speculation. And in my opinion, she has told her about the fight that she had with Lacasse. Jane knows about him being jealous, about her not talking to him for a week. She's trying to paint the picture as if she left the kids with him so she trusted him so much their relationship was evolving so it's not like a random guy that she's dating she leaves her kids with him that's what she's painting a bigger picture i feel like you and i look a little bit of like do you see this as you're looking at my face you have very pretty blue eyes they're much bluer than mine <laughs> but i feel like Anyway, so this was the, the last clip. It doesn't mean anything. It's just a random clip that I found interesting. I found it interesting how she's trying to bond with the victim advocates. I hope you liked this video. And if you did, please give it a like, subscribe, comment if you want to. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.